Hello, Shalom. I'm Betty McKinney, and this is our third in our series in the footsteps of Jesus from Israel. And today we are at the beautiful Sea of Galilee. Isn't that just a beautiful sight? Look at the beautiful flowers, the sky, the sea behind me, the Golan Heights behind me. Um, this Sea of Galilee, sometimes also in the Bible called the Sea of Kinneret, the Lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Tiberias. Um, the modern name in Hebrew is Kinneret, and that word can be translated harp. If we were looking down from above from a helicopter, you would be able to see that the sea actually is in sort of a harp shape. It resembles the shape of the lake, resembles a harp. And also, the waves make a soothing, harp-like sound. So that's how it came to be called Kinneret, or harp. The Sea of Galilee is 60 miles north of Jerusalem. It's a very small area. It's a freshwater lake, 34 miles in circumference, 13 miles from north to south, and 8 miles across from east to west. It's 700 feet below sea level. The River Jordan feeds it from the north as the, the water comes down from Mount Hermon in the north. The River Jordan feeds it, and then the River Jordan continues out from the south, emptying the Sea of Galilee, going all the way down to the Dead Sea. And it's, it's a very peaceful place, it's a very calm place, but we know from stories in the Bible and we know from experience that um, it, its position in the Jordan Valley Rift renders it vulner vulnerable to um, downwinds, very powerful downwinds that can stir up sudden violent storms, which can make the waves on the lake very dangerous. Remember the story in Mark 4, where the disciples are in the boat and terrified that they're going to lose their lives in the waves crashing into the boat, and Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat because he's in control of nature and the waves. So this, as I said, this area, one of the things when you come to Israel and you go to Galilee, you're just amazed at how, how small the area is, how close everything is. But on and around this 34 miles, this Sea of Galilee, Jesus performed 18 of his 35 recorded miracles. And he taught his disciples here, and he taught the multitudes that followed him from village to village. So um, we're going to look at this area called the Galilee. What is so special about it? Why did God choose it? What makes it different than every other place on earth? Because this, this pastoral, seemingly quiet, out of the way, tiny area, called Galilee, is the place where God chose to send his son to walk amongst us. Sorry, he didn't send him to Switzerland. <laughs> he didn't send him to Peru. He didn't send him to New Zealand. He sent him here, in this land of Galilee. And Galilee, off the beaten path, is where Jesus spent most of his time going from village to village in this tiny area. Um, if we were, if we could look at a map right now, on the north shore of Galilee, you probably know this, you can look in the back of your Bible and see it, there's three, three little villages, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. We call this the Triangle of Ministry, or the Evangelical Triangle, because those are the three towns in which Jesus did most of his miracles and his teaching. But we know that, for the most part, these cities, these towns, did not receive him. And Jesus ended up cursing them for their unbelief. It's just, it's overwhelming when you come here to Galilee and you realize God in human form, God's presence walked these hills, walked through these villages, did these amazing miracles, even calming the 15 or 20 foot waves on this sea behind me. And yet, most people missed him. Why did they miss the fact that God himself, in hu Emmanuel, taking on human form, was right there in their midst? You know, we, we can say that. We can look back and say, how could they be that way? How could they do that? How, how did the Jewish people not recognize that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah? Have you ever wondered about that? Well, 
let's, let's set the scene. Let's look at the Galilee that Jesus entered. Um, it had been 400 years since there had been a prophet in the land. So there had not been anyone speaking for God to the people for over 400 years. 400 years of silence from the prophets. So what's the last things the prophets had written about this Messiah that was coming? I could quote dozens of them, but I'll just, I'll just um, quote two of them. Zechariah 14.9, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. Then Haggai 2, 22 and 23. And I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. Okay. Dozens and dozens of Old Testament prophets talking about a conquering hero, a military, political hero that was going to come and overthrow all other nations, and he would be the only king, and there would be no more pagan, Gentile nations ruling over them. He would come, um, you know, they'd had the Assyrians, they'd had the Babylonians, they'd had the Persians, now they have the Romans, pretty soon they're going to have the Greeks, and they are just tired of being ruled over by pagan Gentile nation. So they are looking for a military hero that's come riding in and depose all other nations. Isaiah 9.6. Let's go there. We're going to be jumping around in the word quite a bit here in this teaching about Galilee. Isaiah 9.6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Now the son was born in Bethlehem, right? The child was born in Bethlehem. The son grew up in Nazareth, as we looked at in our last two teachings. But then there's a uh, semicolon, and that separates the child being born and the son growing up in Nazareth and becoming a man, growing into manhood and doing his ministry. As we go to the next line, it talks about his second coming, <laughs> when he comes back as conquering king, lord of lords, king of kings destroys the Antichrist and his armies, and then sets up the throne of David, which will last forever and ever. But that is separated by 2,000 plus years. That's, you've heard me teach about this before. That is the secret to understanding Old Testament prophecy, that Jesus' first coming and his second coming can be separated by simply a, a comma or a semicolon. But the people were looking for the second coming. <laughs> they were looking for the second coming events to happen. They were not noticing so much that first he's just going to be a child. He's going to be a son, a son of God, the son of man in our midst. They're looking for a, a big one. <laughs> so they don't notice. Um, they don't see their own scriptures. They don't interpret them correctly. One understood probably better than anyone else, and that was John the Baptist. Um, in Matthew 3, as he introduces this son of God, this child who is born of a virgin and has come to dwell with us. Um, in Matthew 3.11, he says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So, John the Baptist understood better probably than anyone who Jesus was, but yet he even came to a place, didn't he, where he questioned, are you the one or should we look for another? You don't seem to be doing Messiah-like things. <laughs> we expected more of, of the one that was sent from God. Amen? In, uh, in Luke 7, 9, 19, he sent a message to Jesus saying, are you the one or should we look for another? Jesus didn't fit even his ideas. Jesus um, was misunderstood by absolutely everybody. 
and he was criticized because he was misunderstood. The response that Jesus gave to John when he sent John the Baptist, when he sent this message saying, are you the one? Because you're not acting very Messiah-like in my mind. I thought you were going to do a lot more for us, for our nation, for our people who are oppressed. And the only answer that Jesus returned to him, we find in Luke 7.23, he says, blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Or other translations say, blessed is he who is not offended in me. In other words, you're not put off, you're not offended because Jesus doesn't act like you think your Messiah, your God, should be acting and vanquishing your enemies the way you think he should be vanquishing them. (laughs) Amen? Um, A tragic um, result of this, misunderstanding Jesus, missing him, not receiving him for who the prophets had said he would be, is found in Luke 19, verse 41, where Jesus is in Jerusalem. This is the last week of his earthly life. And in verse 41, it says, And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it. And this took place somewhere on the Mount of Olives, as Jesus was coming from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, and he looked over Jerusalem, and his heart was just broken at the way they had missed him. They had not received him. They had not understood who he was. Verse 42, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Sad words, tragic words, amen? You see, when Jesus does not conform to our preconceived idea of who we think he should be, we're going to have a spiritual crisis. (laughs) And this did happen to the Jews, but it can happen to us as well. We have the whole Bible now. We understand now the first coming and the second coming. We have books upon books and teachers upon teachers. But we can still fall into that same mentality that the Jews, John the Baptist, watching for a Messiah, that they fell into. We can have such preconceived ideas that we also miss him in ways. What's a way you can miss him? Maybe you've lived most of your Christian life under a sense of condemnation, legalism, performance, thinking God's always mad at you, disappointed in you, wanting to punish you, that God is is, um, somehow you aren't measuring up to his standard, and so he's disappointed in you. That's missing God. That's putting upon him your preconceived ideas of who he is instead of who he reveals himself truly to be. You know, this, this land of Israel was chosen by God out of all the nations in the earth. This little tiny land that is the size of New Jersey. <laughs> it fits in, the state where I come from is Montana. It would fit within Montana 16 times. That's how small the nation of Israel is. But this land that was given to the Jews by covenant, by God, and then God gave them his law, And he gave them the feasts to observe that would pretty much form their yearly life and their routine. This history, 6,000 years of history in Israel, all points to Jesus. Points to Jesus. You look in the Old Testament, everything is pointing, pointing, pointing to Jesus. Yet, when he came as the fulfillment of it all, of every law, of every feast, they missed him. And they're still missing him today. Romans 11 says a blindness has come over Jewish hearts. But we also, as Christians, can miss him in many ways, even if we know him. When I take groups to Israel, you know, there's so many wonderful places to see, so many wonderful happenings to remember that are some of our favorite Bible stories, and it's really cool to see that place. But I'm telling you, if you you go to Israel and you miss Jesus... (laughs) then why even go? Um, 
When I take people to Israel, my heart, my desire is that people will be healed and renewed in terms of who he is and who they are in him. To go to Israel and see many wonderful sights and miss him is tragic. So let's talk, since we're in the Galilee, let's, let's talk some more about um, the uniqueness of this area and perhaps why God chose this specific tiny area to place his son and to give his message. I'm going to go to Matthew 4, 12 through 16, which is a quote from the Old Testament of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. So Matthew 4, 12 says, um, Now when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Isaiah's observation here that Galilee was of the Gentiles is a really important point. It says Galilee of the Gentiles in verse 15. Or Gentiles could also be translated the nations because basically the world is divided into two kinds of people. You're either Jewish or you're of the nations. You're either Jewish or you're a Gentile. So Galilee of the Gentiles. See, ever, ever since the Assyrian invasion from the north in 722 BC, Galilee contained many more Gentiles, a mixture of Jews and non-Jews than any other part of Israel. Compared to Jerusalem, Galilee was a place where Jews were constantly having to interact with Gentiles. Another thing about um, Galilee that made it different from the rest of Israel is that the Galileans were always on the edge of a revolt against Roman oppression. It's sort of like the place where the militia, the Israel militia, hit out. <laughs> 30 years before Jesus, there had been a rebellion against Rome, launched by Galilean zealots. And uh, 30 years later, in 67 AD, there would be another one. Vespasian would kill over 6,500 Galileans. So this had been the atmosphere in Galilee for years and years. Just this zealous, let's overthrow Rome. Let's pull all our resources together. They were, that was the hot spot of revolt. So as Jesus came along, and he begins to talk about another kingdom, the kingdom of God, it didn't take much <laughs> for words like that to uh, spark, uh, could set up a spark that would, would flame the fire of revolt against Rome. You know, we think of Jesus as just wandering around, like look at the beautiful bougainvillea behind me with the pink flowers, wandering around, telling quiet parables, um, taking children on his lap, doing good. The reality was he was proclaiming a very dangerous message, <laughs> a very radical message, announcing there is another kingdom and it's coming, and it will be forever. The kingdom of God, which is greater than the Jews could conceive of, greater than Rome or the Gentiles could conceive of, greater than any empire that had ever existed, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Romans, and which is actually, Jesus said, right here now in our midst. This was a radical message. And as far as the Romans went, Jesus declared that there really is no point in fighting the Romans. <laughs> in fact, he exhorted people to bless their enemies. If a Roman insisted that you go one mile with him, which was the law under Rome, go two. <laughs> um, if, uh, and that you are, are blessed if you make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Don't be a zealot. Don't be looking for a fight. Instead, seek how you may, to whatever degree depends on you, be at peace. Um, another thing Jesus did was he made a lot of people mad. <laughs> he infuriated people by his 
implication that Gentiles could be included in this kingdom, that they could have a place, and that many of the old ways of Israel keeping themselves separated from the Gentiles would soon become obsolete. So as he went from village to village, teaching and preaching and ministering, he was continually breaking cultural, social, gender, religious, racial taboos, bigotry and, and passions, and he reached out to both Jews and Gentiles in need. He went to the lowest, he went to the most despised. His ministry was totally radical from any other rabbi that had ever traversed through these little villages in this place. Just think of the woman at the well in Samaria, uh, the Roman centurion who he healed his servant, the Syrophoenician woman who he healed her daughter, set her free from a demon. The demoniac behind me on the Golan Heights, somewhere over there, the man who had a legion of demons. Jesus actually went to him, found the man, and saw the man behind all that torment and said, there's a person in there, and I want to set that person free. And then, of course, his favorite people to hang out with were tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. <laughs> This all caused Jesus to be grossly misunderstood. <laughs> Even his family feared that he would be viewed by the Jews as a traitor and by the Romans as a threat. And they begged him to just tone down his message and just, just come home and be quiet, son. <laughs> we don't want you to start trouble. We don't want you to get in trouble. But, you know, <laughs> Jesus was fulfilling and if the Jews had been paying attention to their own scriptures, they would have known this. Um, he was fulfilling what God first spoke to Abraham when he made covenant with him. I'm looking at Genesis 12. I'm going to just read verses 2 and 3. God says to Abraham, And I will make you a great nation, meaning the Jews that would come forth from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants. And I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. <laughs> this little tiny land of Israel, the size of New Jersey, was chosen by God to be the place, the vehicle for bringing salvation to all the families of the earth. All tongues, tribes, and nations. Jesus announced the fulfillment of Israel's destiny to make the kingdom of God available to anyone who believes, including Gentiles. That means Romans could come in. That meant Samaritans could come in. All this racism, all this hatred, all this cultural... He said, everyone is welcome into the kingdom I'm presenting. Um, the Jews hated him for this message, but God had told Abraham... That was his plan all along. <laughs> because Jesus' message was so radical in this setting, he spoke in parables and riddles a lot of the time. Just kind of, I think, letting people into the secret gently and wisely. Because it was only for those who really wanted to seek the kingdom. If he'd just spoken openly about himself as king of this kingdom, there were many who were ready to take up arms against the Romans. So you always find him trying to escape those, those situations where they were trying to make him king, right? He, he brought the message quietly, subtly, so that those who are, were intrigued would say, I want to know more about this kingdom. But they wouldn't just act on their initial impulse to say, good, we have a king, let's go fight Rome. <laughs> so he was walking a very, very, uh, what, um, Tight, tight rope there. Instead of letting them make him king and lead a revolt against Rome, Jesus' message was to take up their cross and follow him. To seek first the kingdom of God above all other allegiances, even to their own nation. That's something that might be good for us to remember today. <laughs> 
as we are looking at our nation and wondering what's going to happen to it, there isn't an American flag behind God's throne. We are, lo- we are members, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And though we love our nation and we want the best for it, the ki- we must seek first the kingdom of God and put our allegiance and our hope and our priority into the kingdom, not our current nation and the troubles it has and what we wish God would do for us as Messiah to fix our problems. Amen? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Jesus instead of being allowed to, to be made king and lead a revolt, he said, the way to deal with your enemies is to bless them. The way to save your life is to lose it. <laughs> Always in the kingdom, the way up is down. The kingdom is upside down from this world. Israel, yes, is God's chosen land. The Jews, yes, are God's chosen people. They were and they still are. But from the very beginning, as I read from Genesis, God had something even greater in mind. A kingdom where he rules and reigns, where all of us are invited to have a place forever. So again, when, when you go to Israel with me, <laughs> I... I, I love Israel. I love the food. I love the weather. <laughs> I love the, the various topographies and climates. And just, I love everything about it. But the purpose of going to Israel is not just to see cool sights, but to have revelation. That ideas you might have had about Jesus, about God's plan, about what's important, will be challenged and changed forever and that the Holy Spirit will minister fresh revelation of Jesus and the kingdom to you. Matthew 11, I'm going to go there, 25. Matthew 11, 25. Hang on a second. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, this was pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. What Jesus wants for us, when we look at Israel, at his life, at, at, at the word, he wants, a, he wants to reveal the Father to us. He wants to reveal himself to us, not just get knowledge, not just see sights, not just have experiences, but have revelation. That is his heart, that you not miss him or put your own concepts on who he is and then suffer under a wrong idea of who God is, but that you know him for who he is. That's his heart for you today. That's why we go to Israel. That's why I'm doing this Israel series. I want you not just to love Israel like I do. (laughs) I want you to get a revelation of Jesus. That's what he wants. And Jesus said to John, Blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Meaning, blessed is the one that doesn't cling to his own concepts that really come from the devil to distort who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. So, as we finish up today, I want to ask you to be totally honest with yourself. What might be causing you to miss him in his fullness as the Jews missed him, as his own family, his own extended family, cousins and second cousins, (laughs) missed him? The Jews missed their Messiah because he didn't fit with their idea of what Messiah should be. So what questions about Jesus, what confusion about Jesus is bothering you? Things like, here's some examples. Well, if God loves me, why does he let this painful situation continue in my life? If God loves me, why doesn't he answer my prayer? Is there something between me and God? Because I just feel I can't get through to him. Okay, These are the kinds of things. Perhaps you have some of these wrong concepts. We all do. 
We all do. So we just have to be honest with ourselves. Find it, discover it, and say, Lord, I want to exchange this for the truth. I don't want this wrong concept anymore. Conclusions like God just doesn't love me like he loves other people. God doesn't listen to my prayers like he listens to others. God wants me to perform and do better before he'll ever be pleased with me. Um, God is imposing standards on me that are too difficult for me to keep. Um, Oh, I just must not have faith, so God is not pleased with me. Just all these things that we get, we get stuck in that are wrong. So I ask today for you, I, I pray for you today, as you're with me here at the beautiful Sea of Galilee, that Jesus' desire for you would be fulfilled, that you have a revelation, a fresh revelation, because we need it continually. This isn't something we get once. This isn't something we go to Israel and we just get it. (laughs) This is something that we have to have a continual, fresh revelation of who Jesus is that will revitalize your relationship with him and bring healing to that area of your life that's hurting, that will bring deliverance from lying, lying voices, lying spirits that are telling you something that's not of God, that will just give you peace and allow you to rest in him and his goodness of who he really is. And we'll put the kingdom in your heart as never before so that whatever is happening around us in our nation, in our lives, we say, it's hard, it's bad, but this isn't it. (laughs) The kingdom is where I'm headed. That's where I belong. That's where I'm a citizen. That's where I have a home. That's where there's peace and safety and no more tears and no more sorrow. And that's where my eyes are fixed. David said it. One thing. I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek to behold the beauty of the Lord. So I pray for you today as you think about this little beautiful place of Galilee where our Lord spent most of his life. I pray for you that you will behold him and see him as you never have before. That's my prayer for you today. Amen. To every generation He gives the joy.